Released in October of 2011 by id Software, Rage is an interesting teaser to a much larger game that we never get to play. In Rage, you play as an Ark Survivor, who wakes up in a Mad Max-style post-apocalyptic world and is quickly drafted into a war against a former government organization that is stereotypically evil for no real apparent reason. Back off. To make things even more convenient, this pseudo-government is also hunting you for your delicious nano-goo that makes you superhuman. Why are government organizations always so damn evil? Step back. First, the good. We're specifically reviewing the PlayStation 3 version of Rage, and we gotta say, it ran flawlessly which is absolutely amazing for any game with Bethesda's name attached to it. Rage runs at a constant 60 frames per second, no matter how many people, cars, bandits, mutants, or whatever the hell else happens to occupy your crosshairs for the moment. Continuous frame rate in games like Rage is typically a huge problem. Take Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Oblivion, Skyrim, etc. Rage displays a refreshing technical achievement for console games running smoothly. Even the characters seem to move with this eerie flow to their bodies. Dust settled from the Big Bang. Outer space plants or mutated plants, who cares? But in the right hands! Speaking of which, the characters of Rage really add to the experience of the Rage world. Well, well, look at what Hagar said to us. How dare you think you can walk into our house? The first character you meet, taking the Bethesda habit of getting a celebrity to voice the first character, is gloriously voiced by none other than John Goodman. I'm Dan Hager, and you are one lucky son of a bitch. The general character designs fit the world well. The clothing isn't quite the we just raided an Oshman sporting goods of Mad Max, but it's close enough to draw an obvious parallel. Some of the more fun designs even include little bits of tech attached to people. Think Spencer from Bionic Commando. We help you, you help us. All these little details really help create the greater world around you, which has a defined character of its own as well. Every town you visit has a considerable amount of individual flair that brings the overall world to life. Subway Town has long, winding tunnels and is dimly lit. Wellspring has a strong Wild West appeal that's full of blowing sand for everything to choke on. All of these things roll together to create the rather engaging world of Rage. Beyond general exploration, you can also do a variety of missions, races, and minigames in order to gather wealth and better weapons to more efficiently turn your foes into liquid gore. The cars and racing portions of the game are fun as hell. While playing Fallout 3 in New Vegas, the chief annoyance was that there were no vehicles to drive around in or fight with, against, whatever. This was made only more frustrating by all the broken down cars, motorcycles, and empty gas cans you could find lying around. Rage fulfills this need for vehicular manslaughter and allows you to travel around between areas with said vehicles. Sure, other games do allow for quick travel, but that consists of clicking an area of the map and watching a loading screen for half the damn game. Physically traveling from one spot to another via vehicle actually makes you feel part of the world and lets you experience it better as a whole. Now, the weapons of Rage are pretty straightforward, but the game does a good job of keeping your arsenal interesting. Each weapon has a variety of different ammo types that each suit a specific task. Fortunately, or you know, unfortunately, all of these tasks are create as many various sized holes in people as possible. One of the more interesting weapon ammo combinations is the mind control dart shot by the crossbow. Once you hit an enemy with a mind control dart, you gain control of that enemy for a short time. From there, the only real option you have is to detonate their mind controlled bodies near other enemies for added carnage. Now, I know that sounds like hilarious buckets of fun, but to be honest, it really, really is. Eventually, you're able to create some side weapons that range variably from useful to, well, not useful. The most prominent side weapon is the wing stick. This boomerang style weapon can be thrown to decapitate enemies silently or just to get a quick kill and then it will return to you, unless there are obstacles in the way. Or after the third consecutive throw. Or 
if it's a wall, in which case it breaks. They can also get stuck in the heads of your enemies, in which case you'll have to retrieve it physically before the body disappears. So, yeah. But you can always make more. You can carry hundreds of the little suckers with you for great down-under fun. The two side weapons that are easiest to use and understand are the two different types of grenades. The first is your standard frag grenade. Throw from a respectable distance and wait for your opponent's limbs to fly. The only issue with blowing apart your enemy is that they don't leave a... shall we say, intact corpse for you to loot. The second grenade is the EMP, or electromagnetic pulse grenades, that knock out any weapons or armor that use energy which unfortunately has limited uses until the end of the game as most enemies aren't mechanical or don't really rely heavily on powered armor. Another interesting but almost useless side weapon is the remote controlled car bomb. At first, you think this would be a great weapon to use from behind cover during a firefight. However, you would be wrong. Stupid. Most enemies can and will spot this tiny toy of death and destroy it before it gets anywhere near them. There were a few times where you have to use this weapon in order to get past certain areas, but other than that, the weapon is really worth skipping. The two most useful side weapons you can create are the auto turret and the auto sentry bot. The auto sentry gun is straight out of Aliens or Team Fortress 2. It tracks movement and sprays lead justice at anything and everything in front of them. Now, while the turrets won't target you, their shots can and will hurt you should you cross their path. The sentry bot is useful for almost any situation, except any that requires small spaces. You won't be able to jump over or run around these little guys, so if you're stuck behind one in a tight corridor, you're screwed. Eventually, you'll get fed up and dismantle the sucker, wasting most of your items you use to build them instead of allowing them to tear enemies apart, which is what they do best. Speaking of enemies, Rage is full of some really great AI and enemy designs. This is another area where Rage truly shines. Enemies roll and dodge to avoid your attacks, they throw grenades to flush you out of your defensive positions and will even retreat or advance depending on their numbers. These enemies are brought to life further by the things they shout mid-battle. Some enemies will taunt you and others will yell commands to other enemies. All in all, Rage's AI keeps players on their toes and constantly thinking, which is a good thing. The most fun singular part of Rage is definitely the Easter eggs. <laughs> Saying that Rage is full of massive amounts of id software nostalgia is quite the understatement. Rage is riddled with Doom, Quake, and even the occasional Fallout references. From the very start of the game, you can see the world sprinkled with Mixom designs from Doom 3, Fallout-style bobbleheads, and even Quake symbols. The two biggest Easter eggs, in my humble and, more importantly, correct opinion, are the first level of Doom complete with MIDI music and the Ten Shades of Brown difficulty paths from Quake. While you can't play the entire levels or, frankly, explore too much, their addition is a welcome and entertaining surprise. The most obscure easter egg, again involving Doom, requires you to stand still for five minutes holding the rocket launcher. Eventually, the targeting screen will be pulled out and you can briefly see Doom being played. I have yet to find every easter egg in the game, but exploring the game to see what you can find is part of the fun. Now, all of this is not to say that Rage doesn't have its flaws. Rage is indeed full of flaws that can really give players a sense of gaming blue balls. I promise this will hurt. The frame rate of Rage, while impressive, does come at a bit of a sacrifice. Many of the textures can be seen loading as you walk, which can take you out of the experience rather quickly. So while the frame rate is nice, the texture issue can be a little harsh on the eyes, though overall not a huge issue. The characters of Rage, while having a great visual appeal, lack a whole hell of a lot else. Characters don't really move from the spot they're standing or sitting on, and many times when you attempt to talk to an NPC, they will simply turn their heads toward you and then not say anything. It's another thing that can really bring you out of the game. While the towns have good personality, there is an issue of a general lack of towns. We have the Hagar Settlement, the Outrigger Settlement, Subway Town, Wellspring, and that's about it. 
That's four towns, and one of them, the Outrigger Settlement, barely can be considered a town. And some places, such as Subway Town, look gigantic from the outside, but once inside, is pretty subpar. There are a variety of bandit hideouts to go to where you can scratch that itchy trigger finger, but not a whole hell of a lot else. The lack of any real towns in the world makes what seems to be such a large world feel really small. Rick is closing shop. Moving on. As I said before, in these towns, you can snag a variety of missions and races. Unfortunately, the missions are pretty bare bones. Find the stockpile of bomb making parts and blow it to hell. Most of them consist of go to bandit hideout A, B, or C, and either kill all bandits and wipe them out or retrieve an item, and then kill all bandits. Now, Rage is an FPS, so shooting is the name of the game, but there could have been some variety to the mission objectives. As previously stated, when you do get to the bandit hideouts, fighting the AI can be a lot of fun. However, it can also be incredibly frustrating. While the AI is smart, it does not have ammo limits of any goddamn kind. The enemies can and do reload, but they will never run out of ammo, and thus never need to change their general tactics, such as moving in for a melee-based assault. Furthermore, the bandits who throw grenades to flush you out of your position have an endless box of grenades at their disposal, so eventually you will be flushed out of hiding. As fun as the AI is, it would have been even more fun for you to be able to force the AI to change tactics based on your actions. Though, maybe we're just asking too much. As far as weapons go, while the ammo types do keep some of the weapons fresh, the designs are straight out of the id book of standard FPS weaponry. You have your fists, a pistol, machine gun A, machine gun B, shotgun, crossbow, sniper rifle, rocket launcher, and a variation on the minigun. These weapons worked when Doom was shareware and Quake was new, but not in a game released in 2011. The world of Rage is incredibly technologically advanced, yet we don't get a plasma rifle or a Stark brand Jericho missile? You don't even get the last and strongest weapon in the game until just before the beginning of the final mission, which segues us into our biggest problem with Rage. Well, I guess you don't know anything about any of this. The story of Rage is uninspiring to say the least, and lacking key elements for a proper narrative, such as a lead villain or any real proper motivation. Wait, you don't even know the authority yet. The similarities to other post-apocalyptic games aside, there is no real villain to Rage. Players will hear about how bad the authority is, but you never really see them do much. The authority is ruthless. Pick up that camp. Other than place annoying flying drones around town that just fly around scanning people and broadcasting propaganda that only seems to clutter the hell out of the subtitles if you have them turned on. You're also told many times to not believe anything that General Cross says. Don't believe what General Cross says. Don't believe the propaganda. Who the hell is General Cross? General Cross. General Cross. General Cross. General Cross. Well, eventually you learn that General Martin Cross runs the authority with an iron fist and wants to control the wasteland. Those bastards want to control everything. That includes this town and everyone in it. But you never meet General Cross at all during the freaking game. You would think at some point when you were working to take down this allegedly evil group of men, you would at least get the chance to pump some rounds into General Cross's militant ass in a crazy over-budgeted showdown. The war starts now. Or at least get to face him while he makes a huge spiel about his great plans for the future, blah, 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 blah. We can all rebuild society together. Without a present villain, the game has no feel or conflict outside of what a bunch of NPCs tell you that you're supposed to believe. He created the authority for his interests, not those of the people. So, you know that the Authority is looking for you, as you are an Ark survivor. And they'll know you're from the Arcs, which means they'll be looking for you. But why? I know you got questions, but we gotta get moving. Well, as it turns out, every person who was put into an Ark was injected with... <sighs> nanotrites. No, 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 no. Not nanomachines. Nanotrites. Spelled different. Yeah. Nanotrites are tiny machines that will help their host, i.e. you, or Ark survivors, recover from injuries and death through a defibrillator. 
they also enhance your stamina as well as strength. Those bandits shouldn't be too hard to take down. Not for you. The Authority apparently uses these nanomachine- uh, nanotrites for various experiments, which lead to the creation of the game's most prominent enemy, the mutants. The human mutations weren't caused by cosmic radiation from the asteroid hit. The mutants were created by the Authority experimenting with nanotrites and humans. Other than the Authority experiments, the nanotrites serve more as a reason as to why you have regenerating health and can be a badass, as opposed to any real plot device. The mutants in the game aren't major players for control of the wasteland, and the authority mutants you fight aren't exactly the most formidable of enemies, so my point is this. The nanomachine- uh, nanotrites and their applications don't amount to some giant plot point or twist in the story. They're more of a plot excuse than anything. In addition, all the missions you complete, regardless of whatever else you manage to accomplish, you just saved an entire town from certain death. Don't really affect the world you're trying to be a part of. Maybe some NPCs will say something to you once about it, but that's it. Maybe next time they'll think twice about trying to squeeze us dry. Without seeing some sort of progress in what you're doing in the world, there's no sense of accomplishment. And while it can be immersive, you don't find yourself invested into the world of rage. But authorities shut all the races down. Some kind of security threat, they say. Don't know when we'll be open. Eventually, after wandering from town to town, along comes some plan that the Resistance seemed to cook up randomly sometime after they met you. We can use the codes in your ID drive to free all the arcs that the Authority has imprisoned beneath the Earth. So here we have the plan. The plan. <clears throat> Sorry. This is exactly what we've been waiting for. And the final goal of the game. It is, quite simply, the key to everything. You are trying to awaken all the ARC survivors hidden across the world so that they can be recruited by the Resistance. But if you are successful at raising the remaining ARCs, then we've got plans and people in place, ready to support those that emerge. Ready to build an army to fight the Authority. Which consists of eight people, including you, to fight the Authority. No one has ever entered Capital Prime and returned. No one knows what could be waiting for you. Now, what if some of the Ark survivors didn't want to fight the Authority? Also, what if they wanted to join the Authority? Many of your kind ally with the Authority. These questions would have been great if we were able to see them in the game. On a side note, the leader of the Resistance tells you at one point that he is an Ark survivor too. I've been doing it ever since my Ark emerged. So why can't he do some of the work instead of sitting on his ass all day bitching at us about it? Then you're useless to us. Regardless, the Resistance doesn't seem to help you in any way other than telling you where to go and what to do. You gotta make good with Redstone before we can start going after the Authority. Take the fight to the heart of Capital Prime. I really need that decryptor so I can read the lost sectors on your ID drive. Blow the blockade in the north, then get to that bridge as quickly as possible. Hell, in Fallout 3 you had followers and eventually got to have an epic final battle alongside countless Brotherhood troops. But in Rage, all you get in the end is a lame fight and no backup. Some resistance. In the end, Rage has the start of some great ideas, but doesn't follow up on any of them. There are the beginnings of a story, but no real middle, end, or legitimate conflict. You're left wanting more and simply asking yourself, is that it? The last fight is against a bunch of authority-controlled mutants that you've already been fighting. Then you flip a switch, watch a cutscene, and the credits roll. The end! There is no final boss, so don't bother saving all that BFG ammo you've been carrying around. It's just a handful of the enemies that you've been fighting the whole damn game. Other id games like Doom and Quake may not need a great story to get to the point, but Rage definitely presents itself as a game that wants to be story-driven. You, the Ark Volunteers, are mankind's last hope. Our survival, our very existence rests in your hands. And if you want to have a great story where you're trying to save a post-apocalyptic future, at the very least, give us a complete story, regardless of how bare-bones it may be, and at least a fucking villain. Christ's sake, just watch Mad Max 2 and rip that off. You're halfway there already. Just walk away. Rage was worth the 20 bucks I spent on it, but in all honesty, if id Software is going to move into the story department of gaming, then they need to really pump some more work into it.